everybody? How are we this morning? Actually, a lot of you beat me down here, so that's good. I guess we're all anxious to get started with the program. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great one. You, you're going to get uh, some really good information today. Well, in 2004, uh, Marianne and I uh, decided to produce a patient conference on Long Island, New York, where I'm from. York. York. <laughs> uh, in our neighborhood, if you didn't happen to speak to Dr. Richard Warner and perhaps a couple of others who were familiar with uh, carcinoid, then good information was really hard to come by. Um, and we felt that patients could get, uh, get better care if they knew for themselves what was available. Uh, so we had Dr. Tom Odoricio, who happens to be here today, come out on a November weekend, and he gave a great presentation. People walked away knowing that their situation wasn't hopeless. Uh, we, just, we started to realize at that point just how important it was uh, for people to hear firsthand what the experts had to say. So here it is eight years and 24 conferences later, uh, this little slogan still rings true. And we're still out here bringing conferences to people. Well, these conferences have been he held in many diverse locations. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, this one here, uh, Dr. Bill Hawks uh, was a member, of, was affiliated with the University of Mi Michigan Medical Center, and he was also a patient, um, and he helped us book this uh, conference in Michigan at the, uh, at the uh, amphitheater, which Dave Vickery, who's around somewhere, was at. There you go. Uh, this picture is Dr. Hawks with, uh, with my wife, Marianne, who you've all met, I'm sure, and uh, Mia, from, Mia Tepper from ISI. Now, this is a picture of uh, Dr. Dr. Odoricio again and uh, Dr. Ensminger from the University of Michigan and uh, the very distinctive green chairs from that amphitheater. Don't ask me why I always have to put that in my presentation, but I, I never saw chairs that green. Well, we don't often get to book an amphitheater. Uh, here we are in Pasadena, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Odo didn't speak at this one, but you can see a few more f familiar faces, uh, Dr. Waltering, Dr. Anthony. Uh, the reason for that is that no matter where we go, we always make sure the audience hears from uh, true experts in the field of neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah, the information that uh, is shared by the presenters is invaluable to your treatment and care. Well, we do have to raise some money in order to do these conferences, so since uh, our beginning, uh, one of our hallmark events has been the annual fundraiser and dinner dance. Uh, the fundraiser back in 2004 uh, raised just enough money to pay for the conference the next day. So I'm not sure, I hope nobody from the hotel is listening. Actually, we have the money today, so it's okay. But uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the hotel would have liked to know how uh, tight our budget was back in 2004. Well, we're very focused on what we're trying to achieve, and it's basically uh, to make care providers and patients more aware of NETS, uh, help support groups to support uh, their members, with information about the disease and to raise funds for carcinoid and net uh, cancer research. Uh, we do this through a variety of activities. Uh, you probably all have seen us on the internet, emails, uh, telephone. We keep our uh, hotline open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. virtually every day of the year. And either myself or Marianne answers the phone. This is just a few of the places where we've uh, contributed uh, money for research over the years. Net patients uh, also have a, a presence at medical trade throws, uh, shows through our uh, information booths uh, that we have at those. 
Well, our government can help us uh, be aware of net cancer. Uh, New York is one of a growing number of states, including Indiana, uh, to proclaim the Carcinoid Cancer Awareness Day or month. Uh, with a little work, I think net patients can have a, a net uh, awareness day or a month in every state. There's also a global awareness initiative scheduled for later on this year, and we'll share a little information about that later on in the program. By now, many people have heard the zebra story. Has anybody not heard the story of why the, all these zebras are all over the place? Basically what it is, and, and, uh, and our, uh, our, our doctors will have to confirm this, but what we hear is that when you go to medical school, school you're taught to uh, think about horses. When you hear hoof beats, you think about horses, not zebras. Since uh, carcinoids and other nets are relatively rare, uh, you can be thought of as a zebra. But don't let that fool you. I think nets is much more prevalent than has been thought of in the past. That's just a little look at what we do. Uh, we're just a small part of the story, however, uh, and we have many friends and allies in the fight against neuroendocrine and other uh, uh, cancers. I want to acknowledge uh, NANETS, which is the uh, organization of the Society for Professionals, uh, Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, lots of other local support groups, ICANN, obviously, and our doctors and uh, commercial interests, pharmaceutical companies. There are just lots and lots of people who, working together, make a difference for net patients. Our commitment is to keep continue working until there's a, a cure for carcinoid cancer. Well, how about you? Uh, maybe you can be part of making life better for net patients everywhere. Uh, just keep this quote in mind. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's a, the only thing that ever has. Here are some basic takeaway points for today. Uh, Look to get a basic knowledge of nets and other re and resources for your own research. Uh, know what questions to ask your doctors. Understand the importance of being involved in the decisions re regarding your care, and know that there are many options regarding the treatment of nets. Options that you will have if you speak to a, a net expert. Well, today we're going to hear from some of the best about a gallium scan, PRRT treatments surgical options, uh, many other uh, diagnostic and treatment options. So get your pens ready. Uh, I wish that more patients uh, took advantage of these live in-person person conferences, although we have great attendance today. Uh, you know, we get to speak to patients on a daily ba basis who really don't know that treatment options exist, uh, and their, their doctors simply don't know. Uh, these, so these programs can really, really change people's lives. Well, I want to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, ISI, Interscience Institute, and the Oshner Medical Center in Kenna, Louisiana. Uh, uh, ISI is celebrating its uh, 42nd year of, of service uh, and they specialize in research and development in the area of net tumors. Uh, the, available right on a table in the back is, the, I believe, the fourth edition of, uh, of their comprehensive guide. So please uh, take advantage and take one of those. Uh, this handbook is a result of uh, the active participation of their GI Medical Council, uh, who are leaders in their, in their uh, respective specialties and uh, they have uh, 150 years of cumulative experience. Uh, so this guidebook adds a new dimension to being able to monitor patients and uh, you know, grab one for yourself and for your doctors. Uh, 
this is uh, the, neuro, the people at the Neuroendocrine po uh, Program at Ashner in Kenner, and they specialize in diagnosis and management of all forms of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, this program is an affiliation between Louisiana State University and Ashner Medical Center, and basically, if you're a net patient, if you're a net patient, they're big. Well, I didn't mean big physically. <laughs> Should you be making a list of uh, carcinoid and net experts, these names would be on it. All of them are published in medical journals regarding carcinoid and other net tumors, and they have many years of clinical research and experience. As you listen to their presentations, please write down any questions that you have and uh, hand them in uh, for the Q&A sessions, one just before lunch and the other at the end of the day. But write them down and, and pass them in to me or, or at the desk or, or up here, whatever's easiest, and we'll answer as many questions for you as is humanly possible. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker to you. He's currently the chief of sections at, uh, of surgical oncology and endo endocrinology at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center and is the clinical director of the New Orleans Neuroendocrine Tumor Specialist Group. He's written over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and has filed 16 patents on novel di diagnostic and therapeutic discoveries. We're absolutely thrilled to have him here today, so please welcome Dr. Eugene Waltering. Very nice. You making fun of me? <laughs> Thank you very much. It, it's really nice to be here. You know, it's like getting back uh, with a lot of old friends. A couple of people I have to acknowledge. My wife's not here, so I don't know how to dress. So one of the patients here today gave me my tie to make sure I had something that matched my suit. Uh, speaking of suits, we have a special person here today, tonsorially correct from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes. That's Dr. Odoricio. It will see his, his outfit today. <clears throat> Just to let you know, when we were together at Ohio State, there was a guy who was a chairman of the department there named Bob Zollinger, and his nickname for Dr. Odoricio was the Peptide Pimp. And so today, he says he's dressed in Guido chic. I think he's the Peptide Pimp. Anyhow, so uh, just uh, Dr. Odoricio and I have been friends for 30 years, so uh, it, just the, the fact that we jibe back and forth. You can't take it, and, and that's one of the things that you'll see today on the, on the uh, interaction between the question and answer group. Uh, we'll tweak one another, but we're all friends at the end of the day. So you, you, some people go out of here going, damn, you know, these guys were going at it hang, hammer and tongue. That's how you learn, and, and it, it's not serious. It's, it's actually uh, supposed to be entertaining. Well, we're going to talk about paradigms today. What are paradigms? And, it, and it's an idea of the time has come when we're going to have a revolutionary shift in how we think about problems. Uh, if you look at a textbook and you say, oh, I'm going to read a textbook about neuroendocrine tumors, you're probably 10 to 12 years behind. It takes two years to write the damn thing. It takes two years to get it published. It takes a year to get the commitments, the money to do the thing. And so by the time you, you get the, the textbook published, uh, you're, at, you're already way out of date. Things we're going to talk about today are things that are happening two weeks ago, some of the times uh, that we're going to talk about. Thinking out of the box, I think, is critical if, we're gonna, if we keep doing things the same old way. Every time we do it the same way we did it a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, the way the textbooks tell you to do it, by the time we all sit down and think about it, everybody's dead. So it, it, we need to think outside of the box. And I think uh, when you come to see our group, one of the things that we're sort of proud of 
is that a lot of times we're thinking out of the box, and it may sound a little radical, but in, in general, it, it's not radical, it, it's revolutionary, and it's one of these paradigm shifts of how we do things. Three things I'm gonna talk about today. One about the use of aggressive high doses of octreotide and monitoring blood levels of octreotide and lanreotide, and does that make a difference in survival? Two, monitoring neurokinin levels for people with neuroendocrine uh, tumors of the midgut, and trying to show you if you have a, a, a neurokinin value that goes over 50, you're in big trouble and we need to do something right now. And then finally, we're gonna talk about optimal care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors and how if you look at the published uh, survival, what are called SEER, the Surveillance Epidemiology and Results Group, and, and you look at the NANETS, which is the, the uh, North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society's survival data, that you, by going to, instead of Dr. Schmo, if you go to Dr. Odoricio, if you come to our group, if you go to Dr. Wallen's group, if you go to Dr. Warner's group, you will nearly double your survival compared to getting care at, at a place that doesn't take care of many neuroendocrine tumors. Well, where do these things come from? I'm the first speaker, so we're gonna sort of try to get the newbies uh, who are maybe at their first conference so that they understand. And that is, there are two kinds of, of neuroendocrine tumors. Those that come from Kolchitsky cells at, that populate the lung and the gut and, the, and places like the rectum and other tumors that uh, essentially arise from the, the pancreas. Those that arise from the pancreas are often associated with peptide secretion. These are things like uh, insulinomas, somatostatinomas, glucagonomas, and each of these come from a different cell type within the, the pancreas or the duodenum. There are other cells that make amines, and these are, and or may or may not make amines, but are commonly make amines, and these are the things that you and I call carcinoids. They can come from the gut, they can come from the lung, they can come from a rare gland called the thymus, or they can come from places like the ovary. And then you have a whole different group of cells that make these amines that are either from your adrenal glands like pheochromocytomas, or from the thyroid where they are called medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. One of the things you gotta remember is that when you stain tumors for peptides, especially those that come from the pancreas, that what the stain says is not what the tumor is. It is what is the tumor makes and secretes into the blood that defines that you have an insulin producing tumor. It can stain positive for insulin on a pathology slide, but that's not the same as making insulin, releasing insulin, and have it circulate in the body. The other thing you need to know is that, that tumors are stained for things that, that don't make a physiologic difference, i.e. like insulin, but things like KI-67, and KI-67 tells us the number of cells that are actively dividing when, the, when the, the slide was created. Chromogranin A, it's a marker of differentiation. What's differentiation? If you have brothers and sisters, how much do you look like your brothers and sisters? Do you have an identical twin? That's super duper well differentiated. If you have a, a, a identical twin, that's super differentiated, a fraternal twin, you may or may not look like one another. So if you look at my three kids, I got two kids with brown hair, brown eyes, and one kid who's blonde and blue-eyed. So blonde, blue-eyed versus brown, that's poorly differentiated. They don't look anything like one another. And, and what's the another? If you're a breast cancer and you look like breast tissue, you're well differentiated. If you're a breast cancer and you don't look like breast cancer, or by breast tissue, then you're poorly differentiated. Same with neuroendocrine tumors. If you look like a pancreatic islet cell and you're in the pancreas as a neuroendocrine tumor, you're well differentiated. But if you're in the pancreas and you don't look like a neuroendocrine tumor, uh, 
the, the derivative cells that came from the island, then you're poorly differentiated. One of the people in the room who's doing new novel things is Tom Motoricio. He's now taking tumors and taking slides as part of a study and staining them for somatostatin receptor subtype 2. We're going to show you that all these stains are probably in the next five years going to go away, and we're going to start looking at gene expression rather than stains. We're going to go back one more or two more steps. Well, for carcinoids or the, the neuroendocrine tumors that arise from these Kolchitsky cells, the KI67 is an indicator of how fast your tumor turns over. In the old days, they had the term typical, intermediate, and atypical. And what that meant was typical was slow growing, less than 2% uh, of the cells are dividing. Intermediate was 3% to 20%. And then you had your fast growing group, which often were not only fast growing, but were undifferentiated that were greater than 20% of your cells were turning over at one time. And so those kind of things are the, the type of things that we look at for every single tumor. If you don't know the basics, if you don't know what your KI-67 is, if you don't know what the chromogranin is, and if you don't know what the synaptophysin stain shows, you need to be asking that question. Lessons that we've learned in the last 10, 12 years of doing these stains. KI-67 is the most important stain. If I can only get one stain because I have limited tissue, that's the one stain I'd ask for. Chromogranin A is the best stain for differentiation, i.e. how well does, or how much does the tumor look like the cell it arose from. And we use synaptophysin mostly as a tiebreaker. Other tests that we now have available that you need to know are available and ask your doctor, are you doing these tests? If not, can you arrange to get these tests done? Would be sending out tissue for chemo resistance, chemo sensitivity testing. Let's, let's be honest here, this isn't a perfect test. The latest ASCO said we don't have any evidence that says that this test is, is worthwhile. Well, let me tell you, it, when you look at the data that Dr. Warner and I have published, it predicted 5-FU Timidar uh, as, as a combination that would be effective in neuroendocrine tumors five years before the, the publication of that combination uh, ever came out. In general, chemotherapy is rarely used in, in the slow-growing carcinoids and is reserved for either end-of-the-line therapy or is commonly used in the, quote, old atypical group, the group that had high KI-67s, were rapidly growing, were poorly differentiated. Very different is the use of chemotherapy in pancreatic-based tumors, the, quote, islet cell tumors, which arise, they're neuroendocrine tumors that arise from those cells called the islets in the pancreas. Those chemotherapy tends to be used far more commonly up front, usually treat people with octreotide. Next move will be chemotherapy, and you're going to hear that that paradigm is now changing. Dr. Vinick and Dr. Anthony are going to talk about getting rid of putting the chemotherapy back in the line and moving things like Sutent and Affinitor up in line. And then ultimately, there are a whole bunch of other tests, things like CD31 and Factor VIII, which tell us how many blood vessels are in at an area on the, on the uh, slide called a high-powered field. It's what the, the, the pathologist sees when he looks down into the uh, uh, slide, microscope. Angiogenesis is uh, one of the critical factors that are coming along, both Sutent and Affinitor, which you're going to hear more about. And many of the chemotherapies all not only kill the tumor cell, but they're directed at the number of blood vessels 
that feed the tumor. One of Dr. Folkman, who is the father of the angiogenesis field, said is you can't grow a tumor if you don't first develop blood lines, blood vessels to feed that tumor. And it makes sense. Try to create a city out in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa and then not put any roads going into it. How do you get to the medical school in the middle of Iowa if you don't have adequate roads? You can't get food in, you can't get food out, you can't get water in, you can't get water out, you can't get the, you know, people in and out. Same way with tumors. If you can't get blood vessels and blood into the tumor to supply oxygen, to supply fluid, and on the other side, you got to take out the, the toxic metabolic waste products as well. For islet cell tumors, you, you want to not only measure all the things one time, like insulin, C-peptide, gastrin, all the things that these tumors can present, but other things like substance P, neurotensin, only based on symptoms. But once you've gone through that, what Dr. Odoricio coined many, many years ago as the peptide profile, once you've gone through that one time, then you only use that when the tumor begins to grow or you get new symptoms, or you, you have some reason that makes you think the tumor has somehow changed. For carcinoids, we tend to use chromogranin as a marker, a blood marker, pancreastatin, neurokinin, and occasionally for the foregut tumors like lung and stomach and those kind of things, we'll use gastrin for the stomach and we'll use substance P for the foregut. Remember when you do the 5-HIA urine test, that's a 24-hour test, that you have to diet control. You have to not eat walnuts. You have to not eat pineapple. And if you do that, if you control your diet, then you'll get a relatively accurate test. Now, that having been said, if you eat one walnut on a brownie, you don't have to throw away your 24-hour urine. You know. There, there is, a, but if you eat a half a pound of walnuts and now suddenly your, your 5-HI that was always normal now is whacked out, you know why. Well, not all plasma assays are the same. And one of the reasons why the people in the back corner of the ISI group is here today is because they have been willing to work with people like myself and Dr. Odoricio, Dr. Vinick, Dr. Go, and a host of other physicians to do what are called split tube testing. Now, imagine we take the pitcher of water, and we take that and we divide it into 10 glasses of water. The water ought to be equivalent in all 10 of those, right? And if I now sent those, those tubes out to test at 10 different laboratories, if the assays are the same and they're telling us the same thing, the numbers ought to be the same. So uh, what you're seeing here is the old Quest assay. Now the Quest new assay has a normal of less than 15. This is the old assay, the normal was less than 36. The ISI assay was less than 40. So essentially the same. And you can see the red line and the green line, in every case, were right on top of one another. That's not true when you send it to someplace else. You, you send it off to Mayo Clinic, their normal goes to 225. So it, it's vastly different. And here's how we use these things. You can see along the bottom are all the times we measured markers in this patient. The vertical line is when we did surgery. And you can see the chromogranin and the 5-HIA on the bottom are pretty insensitive, but the triangles represent pancreastatin, and that's very important to tell us that the tumor's regrowing. And, it, and Dr. Odoricio, right here, was the guy who basically invented the pancreastatin assay when he was at Ohio State. Remember the peptide pimp? That's him. Yeah, I'm not gonna let you forget it, Odo. Okay, but what you see here is a very different picture than the one I just showed you. In this case, the Ohio State assay and the ISI assay 
are identical, but five-fold different. So if you get a number at Ohio State, you can divide it by five, and it's the equivalent of ISI. But you can't do that for other assays like the Cambridge assay. That doesn't work, and we've tried it. It doesn't work. So, but the only time you know that you can do this is when you've done your homework and you've done the study. That's what the other laboratories are not doing. They're not providing you with scientifically validated assays. You ask them, how does your assay relate to ISI or Ohio State for pancreastatin? And they go, we don't know. Well, the first of our questions that we're going to talk about for paradigms. Does monitoring neurokinin A, if you have a mid-gut carcinoid, ileal carcinoid, sequel carcinoid, appendiceal carcinoid, jejunal carcinoid? A lady named Joy Ardell from the University of Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the, and the, the Royal Peptide Laboratory, published a paper along with a guy named Turner that said, if your, your neurokinin level is less than 50, you sort of live forever. And the minute it goes over 50, you're in big trouble. We got to get it down. Or the, in the next three years, you have a very high likelihood of dying. And so if, if you were less than 50, you had a 98% three-year survival. If you were over 50, you had a 13% chance of being alive three years later. Oh, one, one other th point I wanted to make here. If you go over 50 and we bring you back under 50 by changing your therapy, it was like you never went over 50. It erases all the bad prognostic information and you start over again at the bottom. So 50 over, you're in trouble. 50 under, you're in good shape. If you go over and we can bring you back under 50, you're still in great shape. Well, we wanted to know whether our assay at ISI for neurokinin was the same as the one in Northern Ireland that had these, these prognostic implications. Could we use the numbers that Dr. Ardell talked about just like here, just like she used over there? And so what we did is we created standards and patient samples that we assayed in California and then sent those tubes to Ireland. And then we took tubes that originated in Ireland that had been run through Dr. Ardell's assay and sent them to California. So there was an exchange of specimens and so we could cross validate both assays. So now we have an assay in America and an assay in Europe that we can compare. And this is the, the comparison of the ISI assay sending it to Belfast. And it's basically a straight line. And what that says is that the assays are identical. Well, what about going the other way? The other way is identical as well. So that we, what we say about ISI here has the same prognostic implication as had it been run in Dr. Ardell's lab. And that's really critical if we're going to start using that data to change what we're doing for your therapy and say, listen, sweetie, you're in big trouble. We got to do something and do it right now. So that's really important. OK, and so this is from the NOLA Nets group in New Orleans. We, we have 145 mid-gut patients who we've assayed with the ISI assay, and they've never gone over 50. The median survival we haven't reached, but if you look at 18 months, 95% of those people are alive. If they went over 50 and we couldn't get them back, 18 months survival was 57%. I will tell you that what's not on here, but I, I know it because we updated this last week for an abstract we just set in, the 24-month survival is 50%. It's actually 49%. So half the people are dead in two years if your neurokinin goes over 50, and 5% are dead if they stay below 50. 
So a very critical marker, if your doctor goes, I don't want to send a neurocannon because I don't know what it means. Well, you know what it means. And we got the papers to back it up from England, or, or Northern Ireland. We have the papers now coming out from our laboratory. And the comparison of the two is going to be published in Pancreas in the next few months. And if you look at it, if you want to just send one slide to your doc who says he doesn't know what the hell's going on, this tells the, the slide. If you're never over 50, you're the green line. And if you go over 50 and we can't get you back, you're the red line. You're in trouble. We got to do something. And those are the people that we need to be doing multiple therapies and not waiting a year to see what's gonna happen with that therapy. Try a therapy, it works, okay. Doesn't work, we know that it doesn't work because your neurokinin's not coming down. Gotta try another therapy, toot sweet, okay. Well, what about octreotide? You hear me, if, if you follow what I do online and talk to people, a lot of times I talk about octreotide and how do we know how much octreotide to use and the simple answer is, don't guess, measure your blood level. And the question is, is there a way to, that you can do this? And one of the ways is we can look back at our group and ask the question, do you survive longer if you have higher blood levels of octreotide than lower? Everybody knows that there are receptors. And, and I'm not going to define, and, and, and this, this is a complex slide, but the bottom line is, is that through a lot of testing, not only in our lab, but Dr. Sue Odorizio's lab, et cetera, we know how much drug it takes to bind half of the receptors, and we know how much it take, drug it takes to fill up all the receptors. And that ought to maximize the effect while minimizing the wasting of drug. What, that is important. A lot of people ask me, can you have too high of octreotide level? And the answer is, hell yes, you can. Look at this slide. This is by Roberto Denisi out of Italy. And Dr. Denisi took cells and he added octreotide in higher and higher and higher concentration. Up front, as you went higher and higher and higher on this concentration, the, the cell growth was suppressed. But when you, once you exceeded the point where you'd saturated all the somatostatin subtype 2 receptors and started now saturating other receptors like five, type 5 receptors, the effect went away. So the, the optimal dose of octreotide may be a very narrow window. So remember, for the first time, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Odo, but Dr. Odo used octreotide for the first time in America in 1983 on a, on a gentleman with a VIP tumor of the pancreas. And that man lived for a very long period of time. Then came LAR. Instead of giving yourself three shots a day, you got the... But we always were told by the powers of be at Novartis and Sandoz that this drug is for the control of symptoms. Yet everybody like Dr. Odo and myself who was using the drug knew that people who went on the drug lived longer than people who weren't on the drug. And that was really first proven. Now, 1983, count boys and girls, 83 to 2009 for the first proof that it made a difference in survival. And that was Dr. Rudy Arnold's study, the ProMed study, that said you have a 50% increase in your progression-free survival if you're on LAR 30 milligrams a month. My question is, is did they miss the boat? They did one dose. And they never asked the question, well, what if I use twice that dose? Is that better than, or I used half of that dose? Maybe that's the next question. And so that's the question we've been asking in our group. And we, we took two groups of people, make it simple. Less than 5,000 blood level, greater than 5,000 blood level. 
And you can look at male-female ratio, 37 males to 61 females in the less than 5,000, about the same in the greater their body surface because Odo and I and Vinick and Go and, and the ISI team had helped develop this octreotide assay. And we knew that women have higher blood levels than men who are the same size. And the fatter you are, the lower your blood level. Makes sense. There are more, more blood in me than in a, my 110 pound mother. Okay. So the bottom line is, is that less than 5,000, the average uh, drug dose was 37 milligrams. In the higher group, it was 62. And look here. See this point right here? This is when the octreotide assay came online at ISI. And so these are the people who were low dose, low blood levels, less than 5,000, and these were over 5,000. And you nearly doubled your survival with a higher octreotide blood level. Now these are all people with mid-gut carcinoids and there are a lot of caveats here. This isn't a well-done study. We need to do a randomized, prospective, double-blinded trial. Novartis, when we went to them, Dr. Odoricio, myself, Dr. Vinick, they said no. But I think we still, somebody in America has to do that trial. Well, have you ever wondered why that everything that we do, and there are a lot of smart people in this room, and there are a lot of smart people that, that aren't at this conference who are working like crazy on trying to figure out a way to effectively treat neuroendocrine tumors. <laughs> the question is, what if I told you that if you have 20 tumors in your body, they're all different from one another? Now, instead of developing one therapy, I have to have 20 therapies that work because each tumor is different. And oh, by the way, if you do a biopsy and you sample only one tumor, I think you're in trouble. Well, this is work done by a guy named Dan Von Hoff, who is now out as the director of the Cancer Center, I believe in Arizona. And this was old, old stuff. He took 99 pairs of tumor. He took, compared inside the primary tumor to inside the same tumor very, very good correlation between drug sensitivity within one tumor. But when he compared primary tumors to metastasis and metastasis A to metastasis B, there was no comparison, i.e. your tumor in your breast is not the same as the tumor that goes to your lymph node, is not the same as your tumor that went to the liver, i.e. if you have a primary ileal carcinoid, it's a different tumor than your lymph nodes is different than your liver metastasis. If you don't understand that, that problem, that question, you're in deep trouble because your, your doc is doing what I call cookbook therapy. And I'm gonna show you that not only at the stain level, but I'm gonna show you that today for the first time at the gene level. Well, our approach, Phil Boudreau, who's here today, and, and Izan Wang, our surgery group, are aggressively take out primary tumors, lymph nodes, and organ metastasis. We have people that we've taken 82 tumors out of their liver. But it is a concerted effort. It doesn't happen in an hour. Sometimes these guys are in the operating room for 15 to 20 hours trying to take out the, the, these massive amount of tumors. But the most important thing is we don't throw the tumor in formaldehyde. We test each of these tumors and we look and see, are they the same as one another or are they different? Because if they're different and we use the same therapy for everything, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have a big, big, big vat of failure. Okay, so who wins the chess game? I'm not a chess player. But I can guarantee if I was playing Boris Gatsky or Bobby Fischer or one of those old great guys, that I make my first move and he's already played the game 20 times in his head. That's the difference between an expert and an amateur, is I'm planning one or two moves ahead and the expert is planning 20 or 30 moves ahead. 
He's already played the game, put me in checkmate, and is on thinking about eating a hot dog for lunch. What do we test? Well, we test the KI-67. We talked about it. We do the, the angiogenesis stains, how many blood vessels per high-powered field. We send tumors off for drug resistance testing. We test them in my laboratory for, what, can I get your tumor to grow blood vessels? And if so, if I put 20 different drugs on it, what drug kills your blood vessels? And only, not only what drug kills your blood vessels, but what kills your blood vessels from your primary tumor, your liver, and your lymph node. And here's our angiogenesis model. We create basically a blood clot without blood. It's called a fibrin thrombin clot. We put the tumor in and then we put the overlay media in there and we can add drugs to that blue section. We then look at it and we ask at the top, yes or no, black or white, did blood vessels grow? Very simple. And then on the bottom, what we call the chia pets in my laboratory, you can tell how many blood vessels grew and how far they grew out from the cut edge of the tumor. And then this is an example of relatively old now of all the drugs we tested. You may, you may know some of these things. Apopolone, Gleevec, PTK787, Affinitor, a drug commonly used in breast cancer called Taxol, something used for gout called Colchazine, and a thing called Chinese sweet leaf tea. The green is how many blood vessels out of 100% began to grow. The red represents growth, and the blue is the overall drug effect. So we can tell drug by drug which thing works for your mesenteric carcinoid tumor we can also tell you that for your liver tumor and your primary tumor. Another reason why your doc's going to tell you, honey, you got metastasis all over your liver. You don't need to have your primary tumor taken out. Well, one of the reasons you take out the primary tumor is A, to test it, and B, so it doesn't grow, doesn't bleed, doesn't ulcerate, or doesn't cause obstruction later. So those are things that you have to think about. Once you've taken and treated 50 or 60 people and you've looked at their tumors, you can then construct these, these kind of curves for the drug industry and say to Novartis, hey, this is your, your drug PTK787 that Dr. Odoricio and Dr. Anthony tested for Novartis. And you can say, okay, the blue line represent untreated wells and the red line patient by patient represents the red numbers. But you can see this is control untreated, this is treated, that this is an active drug. <clears throat> now I'm gonna show you that, that if we take patients and we take out their primary tumor, their lymph nodes, and their liver metastasis by the same surgeon on the same day, analyzed by the same pathologist, run by the same technician, that the tumors, the primary tumors, the nodes, and the liver have nothing to do with one another. If that doesn't terrify you, you need to find a new form of recreation because you gotta smoke some kind of different drug. Here's KI-67, and this asks the question, patient number, 13 patients, primary lymph node liver, and you wanna look for things that are yellow all the way across. And you can see that there are some where they are the same, but a lot where the KI-67 is not the same. You'll hear Odo talk about the sausage. And he says, when you make a sausage, sometimes one slice of the sausage will have more fat, the next slice will have a little bit more meat, the next slide will have a chili pepper in it. That's what we're talking about. KI-67, the range, however, is not very high. 1% positive, the range is 5. So you could move from typical to low intermediate. Not a big deal. Stay tuned. This is my mom. If, if you never knew my mom had carcinoid, how she presented was a neck node. 
And this is the KI-67 staining of my mom. And you can see she's about 1% of her cells are positive. Now chromogranin. Again, we're looking for yellow across all three. You see two out of this whole group have the same chromogranin. Oh, I'm not. See, these two and that three are the same across. But now notice the range difference. 90% sometimes. So that one tumor is not the same as the number two. Let's look at number one. It's 20% in the liver met, 30% in the lymph node, and 40% in the primary. Very scary that they're not the same. Here's my mom's tumor. The blue stuff is, is muscle, that, and these are how she stained for chromogranin on the neck node. <coughs> Synaptophysin, again, looking for the yellow that goes all the way across, patient number two, nobody else other than patient number two out of 13. One patient out of 13 had all three that were the same. How much did they differ by? Up to 95%. Look at this patient, 100% staining in the liver, 80% in the lymph node, but only 20% in the primary. Are you scared yet? And this is my mom. Notice it's not quite as intense, but almost all the cells stayed positive. My mom had a very, very slow growing, very, very well differentiated tumor. She had it all taken care of at age 90, died very peacefully in her sleep at age 97 with no tumor recurrence. CD31, how many blood vessels per high powered field in your tumor? Again, looking for things that are all the way across. If you're not scared now, you ought to be, because now 60% different, and there's not a single patient here that all three are the same. What about factor eight? Looked at the same question. Again, nobody has all three that are the same, and now a little bit better range, 25% difference between one, two, and three. This is a very busy slide. What I'm showing you is we test all these different things in our assay. Black raspberry, this is a, a PDGF blocker, apophilone, Gleevec, interferon, PTK, affinitor, SOM230, or pasreotide that was in stuff. So we've tested a lot of different things. The bottom line is, is that there are very few things that are positive in three out of three. This is our control substance. It's sort of like cyanide on the rocks. It shows that we can actually kill it. What about resistance to chemotherapy? We're looking for 100% across the board. Anybody see 100%? your tumors and your primary tumor, your lymph node and your liver, tested on the same day by the same technician, same pathologist, are all different. Well, here we go. Now we're asking the gene question. And so the gene question is, if we took these tumors that we just talked about, the primary tumor, the lymph node, and the liver, and we looked at what genes are in those tumors, are the genes the same? It would seem to me, if I was hypothesizing, that the, the genes, at least lots of them, should be the same in my ear as my nose as my tongue. And some should be different. My tongue's clearly different than my ear or my nose. So to figure this out, we took normal small bowel, and we subtracted it from small bowel tumor. We took normal lymph node and subtracted it from lymph node tumor, and we subtracted liver normal from liver tumor so that we got rid of all those genes that represented normal. So we asked the question, uh, is the gene in your primary tumor the same as the gene in your lymph node is the same? And this is complex, and I just want to take this through you real quick. Small bowel, lymph node, liver, 
patient one, patient two, patient three, patient four. So if you look at somatostatin receptor subtype two, it's in the small bowel, it's in the lymph node, and it's in the liver. That's good. Here, somatostatin receptor subtype two in the small bowel, rub row, not in the lymph node, Type one, type five, type three. Where's two? Not there, rut row. Here, no uh, somatostatin receptor subtype two, subtype two, subtype two. Uh-oh. Here, subtype two. Uh-oh, subtype two. So you can see again, even at the gene level, you want to know why the octreotide scan isn't positive in every tumor in your body? There are a hundred reasons that could be. But we never have had evidence till now that the reason that is is because you don't have the gene for somatostatin receptor subtype 2 in your lymph node here. It's not that the, the octreotide scan didn't work. It wasn't that the lymph node was too small. The gene's not there. The receptor just plumb left town and ain't coming back. Now we have, those were genes that were upregulated, overexpressed, i.e. what you would see for somatostatin receptors on a positive octreotide scan. What about things that, that are turned off? Well, again, you can see the same kind of thing. Pick any one, MMP2, okay up there, not okay here, not okay here. So again, whether the gene is upregulated or the gene is downregulated, it's inconsistent among tumors. You should be getting a clear-cut message now that testing one tumor in your body is not adequate. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about we think that we can do better if you go see Dr. Odoricio, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Vinnick, myself, Dr. Warner, Dr. Wallen, an expert than an amateur. And this is survival. This is from the, no the Nanex publication in August of 2009. You go onto the journal Pancreas and this is a free download. This is our survival, this is their survival, and I'll show you in a second what that translates into in months. NOLA nets, we have 319 people that have metastatic mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor. The, the NANEX group had 116. Our survival, 144, one month. Their survival, 65 months. And if you look out here at 10 years survival, your chance of being alive at 10 years doubles if you see an expert. Should convince you that seeing family doc is a good guy to help work the plan, but you gotta have somebody like Dr. Odoricio or myself, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Vinnick, the other people in this room to plan the work. So you plan the work and you have your local guy work the plan. Well, we think out of the box, we think it increases patient survival. We think that the treatment in a, a neuroendocrine specialty center saves lives. We think that serial neurokinin ought to warn you when you need new therapy and that somatostatin analogs are a good thing and we ought to be using at least that we ought to be planning the right study, which is 30 versus 60 versus some other number potentially. All the things I talked about, maybe I'm just crazy. There would be people at this table over here who would tell you that. There is a new paradigm and you're gonna hear about it at lunch and that's gonna be the concept of multivisceral organ transplant. When everybody has given up on you, these guys take your entire abdomen out and give you a new abdomen. The internet makes a huge difference, patient, patient, doctor, patient, and doctor, doctor. The one way you don't want to use the internet is have your surgeon in the operating room 
going to surgery.com and at going on the icon, are you totally lost? <clears throat> that, that's what happens if you go to an endocrinologist, he says. Are you totally lost? The alternative, be smart, get your second opinion first. Remember that fixing the impossible is a day-to-day -day task amongst the experts. Susan Komen would have you race for the cure. We have slow-growing tumors. We crawl for the cure. And don't forget the patient conference coming up in September. We should have 500 patients, I think, this time. Uh, it's at the corner of Canal and Bourbon. And believe me, if you've ever been to New Orleans, it don't get no better than that. <laughs> Thank you very much.